Professor Godfred Buckman is a professor of economics at the University of Ghana. Prof, you're welcome to Eyewitness News. Yes, good evening. Well, and good evening to you, your cherished listeners. Good evening to you too. It's been long in coming. It's finally here. It's almost like it's coming home, and we are told <laughs> it will come home tomorrow. Uh, celebration or mourning? Well, I don't think it calls for celebration. As a sovereign nation, where our forefathers laid out their lives for Ghana's independence. And they meant well for us. They meant that we will be in total control of our own economic destiny. They meant that the resources that God had given us will be used for, for the people of Ghana for our common good. But then it's a different story altogether. Um, that said, it's, it's positive news that finally we have the IMF supported program. Why is that good? It, it, if you look at the posture of government from towards the end of 2021, when we started asking government to make the call to reach out to the IMF, and where we are today, you get a sense that our understanding of the reality needs to improve going forward. I will, if there's any credit from this, probably I'll give it more to the IMF than our own government. Because the IMF has really worked harder. They attach a lot of agency to Ghana's situation. And right from when the call was made on first July 2022. If you look at the speed with which the IMF came to this country, it looks as though they bought their tickets before we made a call. But of course, they knew. They knew we were coming. We were just living in denial. Now, that delay in, in reaching out to the IMF, in fact, the optimal time for the government to have reached out to the IMF was in the third quarter of 2021. And they should have used the 2022 budget, which was presented in November 2021, to make that announcement. If, if they had done so, they, they, we wouldn't have gone to the IMF in such a precarious situation. Remember, the IMF considered Ghana's application and came to the conclusion that the country was in, in an acute crisis stage. And that is why the board had to quickly, in an emergency way, consider Ghana's program yesterday, just when the funding assurance was obtained last Friday. That is the agency which the IMF attaches the, to the whole thing. Yes, whilst it's positive news because the signal effect is that the economy is taking the turn for good that on the back of the IMF supported program, we'll be able to restore microeconomic stability, which is like fresh air, as our vice president once told us. But you know, interesting thing, on one breath, there's a mixed feeling because if you, if you go to the IMF program, it's work. A lot of sacrifices and trade-offs that lies ahead of us. So, I don't think that we should, we should jubilate over this because there are painful adjustments ahead of us in order to restore macroeconomic stability. Because whether we like it or not, to restore macroeconomic stability is going to come at a price. It's going to come at a cost. Unfortunately, and as you can see in the program, the, the, the adjustment cost will not be evenly distributed. The adverse distributional effect would, would, would impact the vulnerable more than, than those who actually inflicted that pain on us. And why am I saying so? If you look at the IMF program, typically a fiscal consolidation mix takes the form of revenue enhancement and expenditure restraint. But the IMF lends its support towards government approach that 
the problem is more revenue than maybe expenditure or corruption or efficiency. And I think the, that is problematic. So once you design a program that is heavily revenue-based, and look, you are looking at scaling up your tax to GDP ratio to up to 18.2% or so by in the next two, three years. That is a lot of sacrifice on the part of businesses and households. Okay? And, and it, it cannot be taken solely that the reason Ghana is facing this crisis is because of low revenue. That is not true. In fact, with the little that we have been able to generate, if we were efficient and we were able to deal with corruption, this is not where this country will be. You can check Malaysia and Singapore, their tax to GDP ratio, and compare that to Ghana the last 10 years. And you will see that in the case of Malaysia, in the case of Singapore, they made it through efficiency. Lean government. So until we are able to instill that level of discipline, politicians will always get away with murder. And that is exactly what we have in this program. But of course, we cannot expect the IMF to prescribe for us the size, the optimal size of gov government and the number of ministries and ministers and agencies and the rest of them. But I think I, I recognize that limitation from the IMF. And I think as citizens, we must look at this IMF-supported program as an integral part of a national strategy to ensure green, resilient, and inclusive growth and development. Relying solely on the IMF program would only return us faster to the IMF again after the 17th program. That is what will happen. Because the important thing we need to ask ourselves is that after implementing the measures in the IMF program, how many people will be lifted out of poverty? After implementing the measures, how many jobs, decent jobs, will be created? How would the implementation of the measures, heavily tax-based, actually help to narrow quality? Let, let's see how does that draw us closer to Ghana's where we want to be, more especially when our population by 2040 will reach 40 million. And estimates exist to suggest that 58% of that population will be less than 30 years. And the World Bank is telling us that from now to 2040, Ghana needs to create 10 million decent jobs. We are implementing free senior high school. So it means that we have more of of our youth, the economically active age group, that will be entering the labor market. So if that is understanding, how do we ensure the right balance between or the right mix of the fiscal consolidation between revenue and expenditure that allows us to repair the public sector balance sheet without unnecessarily damaging the balance sheet of the private sector and households. These are the critical things that we need to, we need to ask ourselves. And let's ask ourselves whether this program will be able to deliver job-rich growth. This is not to discount what the IMF has done and the speed with which they have come to Ghana's aid. But what we are saying is that the program, if you go through the details, and not, look, the IMF itself is telling us that because of the, the steep nature of the fiscal consolidation measures, growth, GDP growth will decelerate in 2023 from 3.2% in 2022 to 1.5%. Once growth decelerates to that level, it has implication for job creation. It has implication for income. It has implication for consumption. Okay. So beyond, so oh, the point I'm making is that there's a lot more we have to do to complement the limited and usually short-term gains from the IMF program in order to make them sustainable and durable. And what will be the fundamental thing? If you look at the Ghana's history, you will see that our problem is largely governance. 
that manifests explicitly in economic mismanagement. So we have, and it's up to citizens, it's up to us to demand the necessary governance reforms that would, would allow Ghana's anchor to hold beyond the IMF program. Because if you examine the similar programs that we've had in the time past, yes, we are able to make progress, microeconomic stability, of course, and in case, microeconomic stability is never pursued as an end in itself. It's, an, it's a means to an end. It's a means to greater economic transformation and inclusive productivity growth. So we merely cannot celebrate the arrival of macroeconomic stability as an end in itself, because it's only a means to an end. Now, how do we move beyond macroeconomic stability? We don't need to wait till 2026 before we begin to think about post-IMF measures. How do we complement the fiscal reforms, limited as they are, in the IMF program with the necessary structural and governance reforms that, that put some level of fiscal restraint on politicians, on our government, to ensure that we create fiscal space ourselves. The fiscal space we are able to create by ourselves is more sustainable and predictable than the fiscal space that will be conferred on us through external assistance. Because external assistance will not be there for, for, for that long. Look at what we've gone through in order to obtain the funding assurance from our bilateral partners, both Paris and non-Paris club creditors. Look at the shame that has come upon Ghana all over the world, because Ghana is begging, pleading with countries to come to our aid. And the managing director of the IMF practically begging on our behalf for Ghana's bilateral, both Paris and non-Paris club creditors, to come to our aid and to give that written assurance no, no country has ever developed through this approach. We just published Ghana Beyond Aid, which has now become, a, 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 which Ghana Beyond Aid, that, that now suggests we are actually in need of more aid, right? So we, 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 we need to have that. And at the end of the day, we must understand that the best helping hand that we can find as a country is at the end of our own arm. We owe ourselves that, look, we, we need to work together, organize labor, both political parties. We need to come to the table and build national consensus that going forward, we cannot have more than 40 ministers. We cannot. Let's make some ministries, agencies, departments. Look, if you check from 2017 to this, we've created other uh, agencies, authorities that are draw, drawing resources from the consolidated fund. But really, their contribution and value addition to our GDP process, it's infinitesimal. We cannot continue like this. That is why, once in a while, it works well to look at what is happening in Côte d'Ivoire. They are governing with less than 32 ministers. Côte d'Ivoire. Whilst Ghana is celebrating reduction in inflation, which is as high as 41.2%, inflation in Côte d'Ivoire is less than 6%. Okay, so inflation, with the process of disinflation is becoming entrenched. But bear in mind, it's still very high. It's still very high. Prof, we have still a long way to go as a country. Prof, the worry for many is that uh, this uh, credibility that has been given us by the IMF opens the door to recklessness. Um, of course, then we would have access to the international market. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you look at it in one way, the view is that if you don't have access to the international market, we are doomed. But then again, if you consider the fact that the international market is a place we used to come, go to and return to do kenke parties, it shows that we're just happy to go there. We may just go there and then end up borrowing ourselves into a hole. What, what is your, your view on, on this quagmire? Well, I think that um, certainly, given our development challenges, uh, infrastructure deficit, we are not at a point where we will say we can do without borrowing. We are not there yet. And, and in principle, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. Debt in itself 
is not a sin. It's not a problem. The question is whether it's a good debt or it's a bad debt. In the case of Ghana, it's turning out to be a bad debt because we have not been able to invest those borrowed funds in enhancing the cash flow generation capacity of the economy. And therefore, the economy is unable to service that debt without compromising its ability to grow sustainably. That is the point. So what we need to do is to have a right uh, uh, strategy, debt management strategy, that also strengthens post loan acquisition monitoring mechanism and ensures efficiency in our public investment management process. So, and, and by so doing, we strengthen the public procurement as well. Because from 2012 to 2021 or so, almost 80% of all procurement in the public sector have been single or sole sourcing or restricted um, tender. That doesn't lend to competitiveness. That doesn't lend to value for money. So we need to look at all of this. And I think that now that we have the program, we need to have a national conversation and consensus building that to the extent that even if there's regime change from 2025, it will not undermine what we have agreed to do in the next five or 10 years. That will be critical. Remember that in as much as this confers positive news, the CD is recovering part of the lost value and all of that. How do you sustain that? If it's not driven largely by the fundamentals, and the fundamentals here, we are talking about development as it relates to fiscal deficit or public finance, the monetary side as it relates to the real sector of the economy measured by GDP and the various decomposition of the GDP, then as well as our external balance, external balance once the IMF inflows come in, it will show up our international reserves because it will go to Bank of Ghana's account. But of course, because the program also draws on other sister institutions like the World Bank, the World Bank will also come to support some aspect of the project, the, 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 the program, the African Development Bank, then also the funding assurance that was given by Ghana's bilateral partners, the details will be worked out. Others may take the form of debt relief, reprovaling, or fresh funding. We need to make good use of that uh, 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 limited resources and, and, and situate that within broader governance and structural reforms. Then, and, 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 and also strengthen productivity enhancing reform. That mm. way, we will all be proud of what we can have maybe five years to come, 10 years to come. Other than that, don't forget that in 2006, hello? I'm here with you. In 2006, when Ghana completed the HIPIC and got debt relief, and we also finished the multilateral debt relief initiative, actually in 2006, Ghana's debt to GDP ratio came down to less than 30%. Today, end of 2022, Ghana's debt to GDP ratio was more than 100%. In fact, the debt sustainability analysis done jointly by the IMF and the World Bank towards the end of September last year concluded that Ghana's debt to GDP ratio was 105% of GDP. With, when our debt to GDP ratio came down to less than 30% in 2006, Ghana was still under an IMF program called the Poverty Reduction and Growth Facility or program. Given that fiscal space, Ghana actually filed a divorce from the IMF that we wanted to be on our own. That was granted in 2006. On the strength of that, we, we did our first zero bond in, 20, in 2007. What happened? Less than three years, Ghana made a U-turn to the IMF in, in July 2009. So between July 2009 and 2012, Ghana was effectively under the direction of the IMF. Now. What will interest you is that since Ghana gained independence, we've actually spent more years of our time out of the 66 years actually under the guidance and direction and, and supervision of the IMF than we have spent on our own, effectively. I see. Okay, effectively. So, so as a sovereign nation, let's begin to look at post-IMF program 
strategies, reforms that would ensure that we will not return to the IMF anytime soon. And let me conclude by saying this, that you should bear in mind that anytime we, sus we subscribe to an IMF, right, it tells you of a certain pressure that we are incapable of managing our own affairs. And it's also worked well for the West in the new scrabble for Africa, right? So you have to align even to get aid and the rest of them. And I think that in as much as the IMF supported program is good as a country, we must also look at what we have to do to, 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 to support that so that we are able to manage our own affairs sustainably and predictably. Very well. Thank you so much for, for your time, Pro.